This video is the second one in the series on the respiratory system and is looking at the neural regulation of pulmonary ventilation, factors affecting breathing and the impact of exercise on the respiratory system. Neural regulation of pulmonary ventilation. So first things first, we've got an area in our brain called the respiratory control center. So this is responsible for regulating the rate at which we breathe, so how quickly we breathe. This is located in an area of the brain called the medulla oblongata. Now this is responsible for all things breathing. If we look at the diagram, we can just see highlighted in green there that's the part of the brain where the medulla oblongata can be found. Now our RCC consists of two parts, the inspiratory centre and as we can see highlighted green in, that's just to connotate the fact that it's in charge of the breathing in process and we have the expiratory centre within the medulla oblongata as well which is concerned with the breathing out process. So our inspiratory centre, this is responsible for the basic rhythm of ventilation. So if we look at our diagram here, well our medulla oblongata will be in our brain, not quite there but I'll just put a dot just to represent it. It sends impulses down the phrenic and intercostal nerves. So if we just connotate that down here to the intercostal muscles and down to the diaphragm. So down these nerves sends impulses which cause these areas to contract. So as we know the diaphragm moves downwards and as we know the intercostal muscles move upwards and outwards on the breathing in process. Stimulation stops when we breathe out. So then the muscles relax and they move back in and this gently pushes the air out of the lungs. Something we have to be aware of when talking about the expiratory centre is that it's inactive during rest. So when we rest we get the impulses sent down the phrenic and intercostal nerves from the RCC and that's causing the intercostal muscles and diaphragm to move, well diaphragm to move downwards and the intercostal muscles to move out and that brings in air but then when we breathe out because they relax they gently force the air out. On the expiratory centre only during exercise, so when breathing is an active process, it sends impulses to stimulate the muscles to increase the rate of breathing. So these impulses are sent to the sternocleidomastoid, scalenes and pectoralis major and minor muscles. So all of these muscles around this area of the body are all being stimulated and they help that squeezing process to force air out of the lungs and to speed up breathing rate. So there are two additional brain centres which control breathing. First of all we have the apneustic centre, so this controls the intensity of breathing by prolonging the firing of inspiratory neurons. So what that means is that the intensity of breathing can be continued because the brain is continuously sending electrical impulses to cause our intercostal muscles and our diaphragm to contract and can increase the intensity of our breathing and this is also linked to our increase in tidal volume. Our pneumotaxic centre works with the apneustic centre in fine tuning the breathing rate and depth. Another word for breathing rate and depth is frequency and this responds to our metabolic needs. So whether we're exercising, whether we need more oxygen in certain areas of the body. Chemical control. So the chemical state of our blood generally regulates pulmonary ventilation at rest. So what this means is that depending on how acidic our blood becomes will influence the rate at, we, at which we need to breathe. 
So first of all, we've got to recognize when, for example, we start exercising, we produce things like lactic acid, carbon dioxide is carried in the blood as carbonic acid, and all of these contribute to the blood becoming more acidic. This change in acidity is picked up by peripheral chemoreceptors who we can see second on the list here. These can be found in our blood vessel walls and they can sense how acidic the blood is as it passes through them. We also have our central chemoreceptors just at the top here. So these are the major regulators located in the medulla oblongata and they are solely responding to the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So both of these chemoreceptors respond to that increase in CO2 and the decrease in oxygen in the blood. If there's more CO2 in the blood, that is going to enforce the body to increase the rate and the depth of breathing to try and get as much oxygen to the working muscles as possible. Other factors that control breathing are noted below. Most of them are to do with receptors, so I'll run you through how they influence the rate and depth of breathing. So first of all, we've got proprioceptors. So these are to do with movement. They're located in the joints, muscles, and Golgi tendons. And when we start moving at the beginning of exercise, it will be sending information back to our RCC and therefore a decision will be made whether to increase the rate and depth of our breathing. Our lung stretch receptors, so these detect changes in lung tension. So once we start to breathe in more deeply, these will be picking up information and sending to the brain. Thermoreceptors, so it's in the name here, thermo. So these detect temperature changes often found in the blood vessels. Again, sending information back to the RCC to then make a decision on breathing rate and depth. Irritant receptors, so these detect touch thermal changes and pain and at the bottom we have the higher centers of the brain through the cerebral cortex so just slightly different area of the brain there and this is when we consciously decide to either increase or decrease the rate and depth of our breathing so we're almost overriding that natural rhythm of what we do when we exercise or when we're at rest. An example of this could be divers hyperventilating, trying to get as much oxygen into the body before they hold their breath for a long period of time. The impact of exercise on the respiratory system and consequences for long-term health. So here on the outside, we can see seven key things which exercise can impact on the long-term in terms of our performance actually and our long-term health. So if we start here, we've got an increase in lung volumes and capacity to breathe air so we can effectively take in and use more oxygen which is gonna have a benefit for everyday life and for exercise. Improved blood flow to the upper lobes of the lungs, so that means we're gonna have improved diffusion and gases exchange and a more efficient respiratory system. Uh, an improved utilization of alveoli, so just having more alveoli available, more gaseous exchange going on, that's only going to improve the amount of oxygen we can get to our working muscles. An increase in gaseous exchange, so as mentioned, if we can keep that as efficient as possible, it will have a benefit on our exercise and on our long-term health improved recovery from exercise because we're going to be able to take in more oxygen, remove more carbon dioxide and therefore also remove more waste products such as lactic acid. A smaller oxygen debt so after working anaerobically we'll be able to recover quicker and repay that oxygen debt and our respiratory muscles get fitter and stronger so especially when we're thinking about breathing as an active process during exercise, the fact that we can force more air out of our lungs and bring more in with our increased lung volumes just means once again, we are more efficient at taking in oxygen and removing carbon dioxide and other waste products.